thing. And so I, I showed a bunch of footage of sociability, of dogs who, like Nadine, who had passed and highly social. And again, I test these dogs and then, because you can't look at a dog in a kennel or taking them out of a kennel and, and envision them in a home, you know, like the behavior is here and the arousal. And, um, but I know, you know, what it all means and what I look for. And I thought it was really interesting because I, I showed all this footage of sociability. And the dogs are like Nadine or, you know, busy or energetic or moving a lot, whatever, and sociable. And so I talked to these two behaviors at the end and, I, and, I, um, and they commented and they said, oh, we couldn't have lived with any of those dogs. And I said, you know, really, why? And they're like, oh, they were, had so much energy. And it's so interesting because, no, they don't in a home. And it's so interesting because, like, you're from the shelter world. I don't look at that and, and say, oh, that's energetic. I look at that and say, no, that's a, a perfectly good pet. And once you put her in a home, she'll transform. We're trying to predict how these dogs will be in a home in this horrible environment. I'm not criticizing the shelter here at all. A horrible environment is anyone's shelter, is my shelter. You know, what a horrible place to keep a dog for any length of time. And um, so anyway, I thought it was so, such an interesting comment that they thought, you know, even knowing that the dogs were successful, that they were t way too hyper. I was like, oh my God, you don't know hyper. Um, all right, so let's take a look at our Greyhound mix. And um, so we know shit, he didn't get adopted and knocked down an elderly woman. And we know that he's not living in Boston um, with a baby being, uh, having his diaper changed. And one of, some of the observations that you guys made initially was that he was, uh, I think, worried and cautious were a couple of the words that you used. Um, and he is indeed, I would say, very anxious. This is a very anxious dog. Not in the same way that the Chihuahua was uh, fearful, but this dog is um, anxious. He's got all sorts of worried signs on his uh, face, the, um, the way he's panting with his tongue not sticking out of his mouth. He's got all of his facial veins showing. He is hypervigilant, again, looking around, looking around. Um, when he looks at me, he makes sustained direct eye contact with his head held high which is, um, again, not part of a fearful package. Let me uh, fast forward a little bit here to more relevant stuff. Um, how much sociability points? None, zero, zero, no sociability. That was a freeze. And of a freeze and a muscle up, right, his head raised. So he hit threshold on the first stroke. That was a freeze and a head whip with his mouth tightening, all right? And then he looks up and makes direct eye contact with his head held high. And then that, he started sniffing. I think that's a stress displacement behavior. So he's at threshold with pleasurable petting, okay? So far, no sociability. Five, four, and again, he comes in and you think, oh, he's gonna be sociable, but he raises his head really high and takes space. And then he sits and he looks away. And so now 20 seconds of affection, I will call him over. Come on, baby, who's my good boy? And he hard stares me and freezes. And I actually had to diffuse him because he didn't by moving the leash over his muzzle. So what are his, he lives life right under threshold. And um, he has been recycled eight times through the system. And what, either what we've created by placing him and returning him and passing him along, either we've created this emotional disaster or um, he started out, I imagine he started out as a no social dog, no sociability, and um, low thresholds for aggression. And I don't know, I mean, you can't trace every person who owned him and ask them. It may not have been outright aggression that he showed in any of his homes, but he probably showed such problem behaviors that not any one family could keep him. But uh, I think it's an utter cruelty to have done that to this dog or to any dog. He is a mess. He can't even stand in the room with any sort of relaxation. And I think that is an enormous 
cruelty, one that I see more and more in the shelter world because, again, we're getting more difficult dogs. We have less dogs so we can hold them longer periods and we still have kennels which were never meant to hold a dog for any period of time. They start deteriorating. So that's our, our return eight times. Um, was this dog next or the terrier? This cattle dog. Um, okay. This is our white speckly cattle dog. And again, if um, one of the procedural changes I would make here is I would have the, the leash um, taut. It keeps getting loose and it turns into a problem later on. This was just procedural um, stuff. Again, lots of social gestures. She turns around, she puts her ears back, she wiggles her butt, um, even to the camera person. And she's being ignored, but you can see she's come out of the kennel and she says, lady, lady, I've been in a kennel for four days. You know, I missed the exercise, I missed going to the bathroom where I wanted to go, but excuse me, I've had no human contact. And so she keeps trying, lady, are you there? Lady, why are you ignoring me? And again, very little pressure on the leash. If she did any lungeways, which she didn't, she self-checks. She never puts that much pressure, and it's not because she's trained. Stroke number one, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven, eight, nine. She sort of gets bumped off with the knee. I wouldn't do that. There was a little head whip there. That was not uh, sociability. Um, that didn't last long enough. You don't want to drop the leash and pick it up. But let me, um, I want to slow that down. Remember I talked about taking space and giving space? I talked about how dogs hold their head up. So watch what happens. I don't recommend that you drop a leash and bend down over a dog, but watch where she is in space, okay? Here's her head up there. And here goes the tester coming down. And look what the dog does. The dog says, whoa, let me get out of here. I'm in your way. And that's a more friendly, that's what a friendly dog does, moves out of space. And then here's sitting in a chair, five, Four, and the sociability starts. There's a shoulder rub with sociability. I think that was her third red flag behavior. She has very few. And then for the full 20 seconds, there she is. So did she maul a volunteer or was she adopted? So let me show you a follow-up picture sent by the couple. And the photo is, I know you're thinking, oh, it's going to be the wife winning a ribbon in the agility ring. No, it's the husband and the dog asleep on the couch. Is that incredible? Dog's even like drooling and her mouth is open. But again, you know, she looked like an active kind of energetic, maybe somebody even would say a hyper dog, not to me. That's the energy and the movement of a dog who's been in a kennel but her sociability and the lack of red flag behaviors is what is telling you the dog will make an awesome pet. And not just a goldfish for people who don't want to do anything. The dog can do this and go to agility on the weekends and make people happy with the dog's ability to, you know, to be an athlete, which is just it's what it's all about. Lovely. That's leaving our options. Um, what does that mean for this dog? He um, sent um, in an ambulance the shelter worker, and uh, apparently, when he did his, when he was tested, I watched all the rest of his test on footage, and he failed every single section of his test: resource guarding, handling. I mean, you name it, with overt aggression. He he didn't just freeze; he would snarl, grab. I mean, he was in on every section, an overall aggressive dog, um, but he had an ear infection. And apparently the volunteers at the shelter um, con were concerned that his ear infection was causing pain and that was the reason why he was failing the test. And so they asked the shelter to give the dog a week of treatment for his ear infection and reevaluate him. And so they did. And it was during the week of treatment for the ear infection that the volunteer was walking him. She couldn't get him back in his kennel. 
and um, he would get stuck. She said she threw a Kong in there and she threw treats ahead and he didn't go. So she called in the behavior person who followed her in. And when she tried to get the dog in, he balked. He backed up and he touched the behavior person behind him. And he turned to the volunteer and he bit her up and down and up and down. And she did all the right things. She didn't um, engage, she didn't fight back. That was just the dog. And he hit thresholds again. You made him do something he didn't want to do. This had nothing to do with an ear infection. Ear infections don't cha change your, the amount of violence you use or your threshold for violence. You might get irritated. You might not want to feel like having your ears touched. But to be violent has nothing to do with it. I've had an ear infection. I wasn't violent. Um, I've had road rage. And the most violent thing I've ever done in my car is give somebody the finger. I have never rammed another car. I've never gotten out and gone and shot somebody. Um, we can get angry without becoming violent. And what separates us from dogs is not words. Um, so they can get angry too and irritated without getting violent. And this dog had a very high level of violence. Um, a quick thing about um, the amazing thing when I told you I had the, the grad student has the um, 140 dogs sociability tested with sociability scores and then red flag behavior scores. And I, what I looked at was anal swiping and shoulder behaviors, anals and shoulders. And um, it's amazing because the least social dogs most likely to have lots of anal and shoulder behaviors. The most social dogs least likely to have the red flag behaviors. But we went over it and the grad student asked me, um, to sort of uh, categorize some of the dogs. And what was really interesting, there was only a hand. The dog that knocked down the elderly woman. Because again, to be aggressive, you have to take all of the things that make you a dog and who you are as an individual dog, and you have to focus and organize. And um, there are dogs that are not yet focused and organized and far from doing so. And this shepherd, while it's fear, is already organized and focused and ready to bite. And then um, just one more example. This is a, a Kuvas kind of dog. And again, look, he's hardly moving. He wags his tail and he moves his head. Mostly un nothing else moves. And boy, oh boy, he is at threshold. Let's turn on the lights. I need to give you plan A and plan B. And they're, they're quite simple if you'll have the faith uh, to listen. Um, with true aggression, because nobody else can get up, it just has to be George, right? <laughs> Thanks, George. Um, with true aggression, the timing of the event is such that you will not be able to do anything to protect yourself. In other words, like I described with the Chesapeake, um, on a, a, a couple of other things. By the time the dog does it, usually he's either done or you're in the middle of the attack when you register that you're being bitten. Your first plan of action is what I call plan A. And plan A is diffuse. Plan A is do absolutely nothing. The only movement you will make once you figure out that either a dog is at threshold like hard staring, frozen, growling, snarling, or he's actually biting you, he's, he's got part of you in his body, or maybe he's in the air. Plan A always is stop moving, turn your head down and away from the dog and look to the ground. You will feel like wetting your pants, some of you may wet your pants. Um, does the dog smell your fear and know you're terrified? Of course, and there's nothing you can do about it. If it does anything, it'll help the dog because he feels like he's getting what he wants done for you. But you look down and away. Now, um, I was during, I did plan A. It was with a Doberman, um, an adult male Doberman. I wasn't evaluating, it wasn't training. We were all relaxing during a break. It was a group of 15 professional dog trainers on a in professional dog trainers instructor course led by John Rogerson from England. When I get bitten, it's incredibly embarrassing in public. I'd just like to say that. So um, there's a whole group of people were during the break and there's a Doberman, an adult male Doberman, 
from my shelter. I was not going to place him. He's going to be euthanized. He was old and had no sociability. I didn't know what sociability was or wasn't then, um, but he had, he had a lot of other problems. He had been at a no-kill shelter for a year and a half in a horrible garage warehouse on newspaper. Oh, he had just a miserable life. And so I wanted to give him a bang, a bang off, you know, just a great week, his best time ever. And so, you know, he had blankets, he had sunlight, and he was being trained by these great trainers for the entire week. He was having a blast. He was causing no troubles. I had bathed him, I had trimmed his nails, I had cleaned his ears, great. So he's standing, Doberman is here, not looking at anyone, on a leash held by an inexperienced uh, person here. And everyone is talking, and I'm not listening to their conversation because I'm squatting here and I'm looking at the Doberman because something has bothered me about him ever since I met him, about how he looks. And finally I realize what it is. And what it is, is um, I had been told that he had been neutered, and indeed he had no testicles. But in looking at this dog, he was probably 12 or 13, he looked like an intact male, he acted like an intact male, and he had huge secondary sexual characteristics of testosterone. And so all of a, a sudden, it occurred to me, ah, oh, I said to myself, he's, got, he's bilaterally undescended. He has two undescended testicles. He is not neutered. He is essentially an intact male, and then everything about the dog made sense. And so I was like, oh, what a relief. I finally figured out. And so I went to touch him on the flank from here. I'm not even thinking. I bathed the dog. I cut his nails. I cleaned his ears. He gave me no problem. He's been trained for a week. And I touch him on his flank, right on the top of his thigh. And here's the timing of the event, because I wanted to look at his scrotal sac, or lack of. I touch, and then the next thing I register is he's got my entire arm in his mouth, full mouth grip. He's right here, and he's going, shaking me, Rah! back and forth, and back and forth. And here's my first emotion. How embarrassing in front of all these trainers. That's, <laughs> I swear to God, I wasn't scared. I, I wasn't, it wasn't painful. I swear to God, it was humiliation, utter humiliation. It's, but what can I do? I have to do plan A. The damage is already done. And so here, I'm, and I'm on the ground. It could have been my face or my neck, but it wasn't. So he's thrashing me, and I go to plan A. I turn my head away from him, and I look down, and I rode with him. I just let him take my arm back and forth. And I'm thinking, so embarrassing, so embarrassing, so embarrassing. Felt like ages, ages. I'm like, this will never end. But was it getting worse? No. Was he like ripping my face, directing? No. He was doing what he wanted to do. And then eventually he stopped shaking me, but he didn't let go, and he was right there. And I can feel his, him staring here. I still didn't move. He still has me in his mouth. And he stood there for a long time, and then he let go, and he poised right here about two inches from my arm, still, I could still feel him staring at me. And I didn't move anything. I didn't go into his bubble at all. I simply said to the person holding the leash, I said, pull him back right now. And she pulled him off, and he was uh, fine. And um, an amazingly um, minor amount of damage. There was no punctures. It was bruising and some swelling, and he made impressions on the bone deep inside that I could feel. I didn't go to the hospital or anything. And quite frankly, the humiliation completely overrode the fear. So I wasn't even scared. <laughs> Believe me, I've had um, much lesser events with dogs that terrified me. And that just didn't. My guess about him is that he was very badly protection trained. When you are uh, poorly protection trained, you're often uh, tied up to a, a small fence or a tree. And they induce pain to get you to come out defensively. And they usually tweak your flank. And uh, it's not an excuse or anything, but I'm pretty sure that my touching his flank just triggered uh, that because it was, it was uh, sudden and, uh, and you know, uh, it was amazing. Um, but anyway, so that's still plan A. Um, what I don't do is when he had, um, if he had poised himself here and he'd let go, I would not have started to move. And the reason why is the dog must initiate the aggression. He also must terminate it. And if he had been off leash, I simply would have waited. And eventually he would have come here, and then we would have walked away. And until he walks away, until he terminates, I will not move. Um, but in this case, I had somebody on a leash, and I'm pretty sure I could get her to pull him off. Um, 
What if the woman holding the leash had tried to get him off of me? I would have been shredded. What if some of the other trainers had tried to beat the dog off of me? He would have mauled me and he would not have um, inhibited. Um, so again, plan A. And um, I don't care where you are, I don't care if your face is, uh, is, you know, if you lift your hand up to cover your face, in, mo in all likelihood you get your, your arm mauled and the dog was not going to do that. You don't have time to cover yourself. So plan A is, wherever you are at the moment, stop moving look away from the dog. If he's there, look away from the dog and down and just wait. You diffuse and don't move a muscle and then don't move until the dog breaks off with you. Um, and it, it may not feel right to do that, but I'm telling you, um, and if you watch, remember the footage at the very beginning I showed you of dog to dog stuff. Um, when a dog got snarked or whatever, most of them avoided it by moving out of the bubble and the, other, the dogs who didn't, didn't move at all. When B, my older dog B, snarked and went after Gene Roddenberry, he didn't move at all, and she's got him by the muzzle. Had he whipped around or fought back, she probably would have, I mean, she's not gonna do damage, and she hasn't for 13 years, but it would have been worse. He just didn't do anything at all. Um, so diffuse is always plan A. The only time you go to plan B is when the dog is going to take you down. He's either yanking you to the ground or he has knocked you down and he's trying to kill you. And the only way to know if he's going to do that is to start with plan A. Um, and plan A is always diffused. So let's say the dog, um, whatever, you, um, the, uh, the, the volunteer was uh, bitten multiple times by the, the terrier. She just stood there and let him do whatever he needed to do. It would have been way worse if she had tried to beat him off or stop him or get away. It's, you're in combat when you do that. And you will, con you will increase the length of the aggression, usually the severity too. Plan B is you fight for your frickin' life. And you have to understand that once you start fighting a dog, almost always you'll lose. The only thing you're trying to do is prolong the time until somebody else can help you. So you do want to scream or get somebody to help you. Um, I've only had to go to plan B once in my entire life. And it was after I did plan A and it was a, it was a German Shepherd dog, 20 months old. My last story, but it's plan B and what I did. Um, he had been adopted from another shelter by a, a local woman to my shelter. Who had a, uh, she owns a small airport, 600 acres, a big couple of hangars and a big field and an airfield. And it's in her family. She has a brother and a mother and they both work, they all work at the airport with her. She's had shepherds her entire life. She's always adopted them. And um, she called me. She said, I need you to come evaluate my dog. We just adopted him three weeks ago. He's a great dog. We love him. He's a German shepherd dog. We've had shepherds our whole life. Um, but we're having more problems training him than we have our other shepherds. I said, well, what is he doing? And she says, well, he jumps on the customers. And he was very mouthy when we first got him. She says, we trained him not to mouth us. So he's fine with my mother, my brother, and I. But he still jumps up on customers, and we're worried that um, he's going to knock somebody down or hurt them, and we'll have a lawsuit. I'm like, fine. Blah, blah, blah. Long story short, they were going to come to me for free evaluation. I canceled at the last minute because I had an emergency. And she got really upset, kind of irritated. So the next day I was driving past her airport, and I don't usually do this, but I called up and I said, look, I'm, I'm right here. Would you like me to come evaluate your dog? Because I felt bad that I'd canceled. And she said, oh, God, that would be great. She says, where do you want me to have the dog? And I didn't have anything with me. I was just in my car, and I said, oh, well, where do you have him when the customers come? She says, oh, we're running free with us. I'm like, fine. Because I'm thinking, oh, he's had three weeks. He's not hurt anyone. How bad could he be? That was mistake number one, OK? Um, so anyway, I get out of my car and I'm walking across the huge, you know, airfield and no leash, no clipboard, nothing, just me. And um, I get sort of into the grass and I look over and they come out of the hangar area where the office is way down there. And I look over and out comes this German Shepherd dog and it was like being in um, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In other words, from afar. He took a beat on me, lowered his head, looked right at me, and came as fast as he could running across the Serengeti. 
and he never moved his body, his head. He was like this, as fast as he could. And I was like, this was such a mistake, I said to myself. And the first thing I did is I thought, do I have time to get back to my car? And I, I realized absolutely not. I mean, he's barreling down, and she's sort of now running after him. So I said to myself, this is really stupid. This is a huge mistake. And I said, but I need to do plan A. So I, uh, I went over on my hip, I looked down, and I didn't move at all. Because he is coming at me like a freight train. I can't run. I have nothing to protect myself, not even a book or anything. And the, so he's running, and the owner clearly can see that this is different than with other customers. And so he gets all the way to me, rushes up right in front, and then he does nothing, and he circles behind me. And I thought, huh, how lucky, how lucky I am. And as he comes around behind me, he muzzle punches me really hard in the butt, and then he stops, and he keeps coming around, and I'm like, huh, I can live with that. I can survive that. This is, this is going to be better than I thought. So he's still coming around, and as he comes this way, he leaps up and he bites me once really hard in the upper arm like you could hear it, you know, and I was like, that's definitely punctured. But he did bit once and let go. And I was like, I think I can survive this. This is, a, um, this is amazing. And then he comes in front, directly in front, and he looks right at me with these just yellow eyes. And then he grabs my forearm all the way deep in a full mouth grip and immediately bears down so hard I can feel my nerves and my bones. And he starts yanking me really hard to the ground. And the only way to remain upright was to pull my arm up, which was so unbelievably painful. And so within three yanks, I'm going down. So I said to myself, hey, it's time for plan B. And the owner is running behind with a leash. All this is happening, you know, in the blink of an eye. And I remember um, realizing I had to go to plan B, that I was going to have to fight him. And before I did, I said to the owner, please don't think I go around punching people's dogs because I wanted to warn her and I didn't want her to get upset. And so what I did with my free hand, I, I leaned down and I, um, I had to put everything I had in me, mentally and physically. And the dog was bigger than me. I mean, he was huge and powerful and young and confident. And, um, and I thought, you know, if I don't hit him hard enough, this will just, he'll just trigger like a horrible, horrible mauling. Uh, but I didn't feel like I had a choice. So I hit him as hard as I could um, right there between the eyes and at the top of his nose and I just went wham I have never hit anything like that and I just wham and he flew off my arm and he staggered backwards she says do you want a leash I said yes and so I m made the loop through the clip so I had a noose lead and the dog's still in front of me like this and as he sat and gathered himself he looked up at me I had the leash and I stuck it over his head and he came at me again. And, um, I, and he's right here, he's a big boy. So I took, um, I grabbed the leash right under his chin really close and I pulled him toward me and I cut off his airway um, until he just about passed out. And then I kept him at a sort of this anoxic level. And I, I said to her, I said, you can't keep this dog. I said, he's so dangerous. And she didn't need to be told, she was horrified. Um, that was the only time I went to plan B. I believe that the 20 months, if he had, the dog had been older, six months older, I think I'd be dead. Uh, I also think he was protection trained again. Now, I don't blame protection training. I've done Schutzhund. I think it's a great sport. But um, I say to myself, why was I triggered and no one else? And his style of what he did is so protection. In other words, you come in front. If the person doesn't offer a fight, you're supposed to sit and bark until they move or until you get a command circling behind the way he grabbed here and this was such a sleeve bite and the tugging so I felt like he was probably badly protection trained as well although he had no fear it was all confidence that and or um, it was predatory and like the customers don't look or notice they're just walking but I looked up and when he looked at me we had a whole different I knew immediately who he was and this was a horrible idea um, so anyway that's what you do for plan B um, I hope you never get there uh, ever. Um, and it should be incredibly rare. Plan, uh, plan A, honestly, try it next time. Um, <laughs> um, it works incredibly well to diffuse the dog. And you learn it by watching dogs. The dogs that don't get bitten, who don't offer combat back, just take whatever they're going to take and they get out of there. And they usually get out of there without much of a bite. So, grasshoppers.
a hard day, I know. Um, uh, first of all, it was a day of aggression. I, I wanted to teach you how to predict it, um, and I wanted to teach you how to handle it yourself and give you some tips on that. And it was one day, so it's heavily slanted toward difficult and problematic dogs. And I know that that is, you'll hit a saturation point and it's depressing and awful and what it, it makes you do is, it makes you not want to acknowledge the truth of who the dogs are but to find an enemy to blame for why they're like this. And we used to blame the public for being so irresponsible and uncommitted that not, they're not keeping dogs, they're just breeding them. But we don't have the public to blame anymore. It's not as much um, overpopulation, as you can see, as problem behaviors and financial stuff. So we lost that enemy. And so I believe what we've done is we've chosen another enemy, and that is the temperament test. And in some cases, it's me personally. Um, I think I've, I'm, in many cases, the icon for a, a, the personification of um, behavior for shelter dogs. And um, I don't create the dogs. I, didn't, I don't make anything up. I just have a system mostly for observation. Honestly, I didn't do much with the dogs except stand with them and pet them. But what I did do is I took you one step back so you could look at dogs with an objective eye. You don't always want to see what's there. It's not always what, what you think is out there. Um, it's easier to try and blame people or something else. And the extent of the problem is, is pretty full. I mean, it, we're in a situation with the dogs, at least in our shelters, where many of the dogs we see are, are, are problematic and we're not seeing a lot of the easy, nice ones anymore depending on where you are in the country. There are many solutions for how we can change the future for the better. None of that can be done if we don't acknowledge what we're seeing today and what the problem is. Like if somebody doesn't stand up and say, with our spay-neuter campaign, we're losing all the nice dogs and we're increasing the numbers of guarding and fighting dogs. And somebody has to stop and say, that's a problem or it'll only get worse. And somebody has got to say, we can't increase our adoption numbers and lower our euthanasia numbers when we're, um, we're losing all the behaviorally adoptable dogs and what we're seeing are the guarding and fighting dogs. It can't be done. In particular, if we want to continue to intervene in the life cycle of a dog after he's been born, raised all the wrong ways, given absolutely no advantage, and then given up as an adult or an adolescent. If that's when we choose to intervene, then here we are stuck in this kind of bad cycle. We need to intervene earlier. We need to do community outreach and not wait for people to come to us. We need to find ways to motivate and inspire people to have a macho dog that is sterilized, that doesn't get bred or to do what happens in most other countries, which is they have intact dogs and they have no overpopulation and no accidental litters and no um, unwanted dogs. They do a lot more uh, with temperament and breeding and people walk around with intact animals and they just don't have the, the kind of overpopulation we do. And how do they do it? We'll never know if we just go around sterilizing everything and thinking that, you know, whatever. I have a program called Lug Nuts and it is introducing informal weight pulling competitions into high crime urban areas or rural areas now is where still there's a lot of fighting. Most fighting is not done by professionals. It's done by young people in the community and it's an instinct sport and it's, it's often very informal. And in fact, most of the people, most of the guys who have pit bulls um, don't actually fight them at all nor do they want to spar them or have any aggression. They just have a great dog that they think is great and they don't want him sterilized because they don't like you know, the mythology is that you don't get that. And so Lug Nuts introduces weight pulling competitions, children's snow sleds, bags of dog food, sled dog harnesses and a bungee line, a start line and a finish line. The only way to get a dog to pull is through the allure of your relationship and bond. So you call the dog and you move backwards and he loves you so much that he comes to you and many of the guys use that. And the only other way to get a dog to pull is to offer him high value food and to keep his head low and lure him. So either lure him with your relationship or you lure him with food or both. You can't force a dog to pull. There's nothing cruel about it. 
and it will bring a tear of joy to your eye and the hair up on the back of your neck because these bull breeds are amazing pullers and um, people love seeing it and we offer cash prizes and toys and food for the winners and we offer to double the cash prizes if the winners are spayed or neutered and we offer to spay or neuter and it offers especially young people uh, a motivation to have a sterilized bull breed and they can make more money weight pulling and winning than they can studying the dog out or breeding. They don't make a lot of money with casual um, the breeding of a lot of the guardian fighting dogs. They get twenty dollars or give them away at the street corners. So that's just one idea and there are many out there that are just amazing uh, programs and solutions to help some of the problems um, and to make a more humane society. But the first thing is you just have to acknowledge what the truth is, and that is what's panicking people. The truth is that many of the dogs we see are not rehomable in how they've been bred and raised, and by the time they get to us, and they're not just aggressive, but they're dangerous when they do damage. And uh, I'm not saying you have to euthanize them all, but I'm saying we better come up with different solutions because you can't give them to the average people who come in. And quite frankly, I'm sick of meeting dogs adopted from shelters or rescue groups on my trails, on my bike paths, when I walk my dogs, because it's terrifying. And it's in New York now, in when I'm in New York State, I'm, I'm scared to go on some of my trails with my dogs. I'm afraid they're going to get attacked, um, and we've come really close. And, uh, and I don't want to adopt dogs like that out into my community. I don't want other people to go through that. Um, so anyway, it's all difficult stuff, but what I'll tell you is there are solutions for everything. I think the world of dogs is amazing, and there's, I have you know, ideas for changing things for the better, and I'm so ready to do that, because I, I see what it's like and that we need to have changes. A lot of people are fighting what we're seeing, and we'll never, we'll never make positive changes. We'll just continue doing what we're doing which worked for many years, worked for a couple of decades, reduced a lot of the numbers, but right now it's not working what we're doing currently. So you guys should come up with different programs and different things to do. It starts with um, an objective knowledge of what's out there. And uh, so a few things, one is, um, Tammy and Julie, the best hosts. They took care of me like the best kind of guard dogs. They were just um, leaning and shoulders, but we had a good shared joy and experiences. You guys were great. I've never been so well taken care of, honestly. That was really nice. And then I stayed at Alta and George's house, and that was awesome. And I, I woke them up at 4 in the morning. I had to take my, my urinary tract infection dog out, and I, I thought, I'll just sneak out. They won't even hear me, but it didn't go so well. It wasn't so uh, sneaky. Um, so I apologize for waking up at 4 in the morning, but you were great hosts. I had a barbecue last night. I love you guys, and I love, your, um, I love your area here. I think Idaho is gorgeous and beautiful. I love the desert anyway, but I just think it's beautiful around here. And Boise always impresses me, because you're driving along, and it's all wilderness. And it, the signs are like, 12 miles to Boise. And you're like, really? Where is the city? Because there's, there's not even a person, not even a... a and you would, like literally drive right up to it, and then it's like, oh, there it is. You know, you drive to New York, and three hours beforehand, you start seeing the, the first effects of the city, but not here. So anyway, thank you all for coming. Thanks so much to um, all the people from the Humane Society here who brought out dogs and offered them up for my critique and my observations. It's, I know it's like having your own babies criticized. I know how hard that is. They're your dogs no matter what and I thank you they were incredibly educational and very representative too of I think what you know we all see in the shelter fear and um, and aggression and blithering idiocy and um, owner surrenders um, you know but that's the real world so thank you all for coming thanks to everybody